Hello, uh, everybody. Good, uh, good evening. My name is Anna Ptak, and I have the honor to meet here with Sandy Hilal. Uh, who architect and researcher who just finished her lecture that was dealing with the permanent temporariness and amazing example of the work or um, or an attitude towards the space and uh, kind of mm, practical philosophy of um, Madafa, uh, which is a living room, a place uh, that. Uh, mm, recuperates the right to host uh, in different contexts, different situations. And um, uh, I, uh, if, if, uh, and uh, we will be talking uh, and asking uh, Sandy some questions about this, but also uh, we, we would like to invite uh, to this conversation the experience of two other artists, uh, Wim Katris, uh, is this the correct yeah, yeah. way to pronounce it, <laughs> and uh, Karolina uh, Grzywnowicz. Uh, uh, um, Wim, uh, Wim Katris is uh, a video artist and uh, uh, um, uh, filmmaker, and uh, Karolina Grzywnowicz is, uh, is a visual artist uh, with uh, interdisciplinary attitude. And uh, I guess that the, how we got all of us together is because you are all invited to work uh, in the context of the project the uh, everyday forms of uh, resistance that takes uh, probably the condition of living um, in what uh, Sandy refers to as uh, permanent temporariness in Palestine as a starting point for learning how can we learn from this condition and um, and uh, probably it's uh, uh, so and in this conversation I would like to uh, discuss the practice as the way of dealing with this temporariness yes like each of you has a very specific practice and uh, and uh, and this uh, and I uh, while what uh, looking at uh, at your respective practices I uh, I discovered there is certain, um, let's say, trust in materiality. I mean, s trying to uh, w uh, what I, I would I would uh, define it this way. It's not the trust that it will last, but uh, in the things as they are, instead of the concepts or ideologies that uh, predefined them. Hmm? And um, uh, and uh, uh, so uh, and uh, and kind of acting against these predefined ideologies and uh, and definitions of uh, uh, what is the process of life, I found uh, and I found kind of uh, interesting in uh, in how you do it, how you kind of try to. Uh, um, Take them a new look at them and uh, and uh, give them give them the life uh, in your artistic work and uh, and um, let's start maybe maybe from this so uh, uh, so uh, do you think that we can uh, uh, somehow decenter the major idea of a co of conflict, of uh, war, of conflicting sides, of uh, of uh, um, uh, occupation by looking at this uh, um, uh, tiny or expand uh, or uh, or uh, um, uh, facts of everyday life and uh, um, environment. Like, uh, do you? think somehow your practice uh, allows you to, to do it and where it could lead you. To who are you directing the I, question? Uh, this, is, uh, uh, this would be probably a general question to uh, general question to all of you. To uh, I would like to ask about uh, the, uh, architecture in your case, like what does architecture in the context of the of the uh, mm, mm, of the mm, let's say um, occupation of colonization could would entitle you 
to do, to act, to be an agent, and what, what would be this kind of material facts of life that for Carolina and uh, for uh, Vim are a starting point uh, of the practice instead of, uh, let's say, starting with direct um, critique of ideology? Answer. Uh, I mean, it, I think that my answer to you definitely, when we arrived to Palestine and we began uh, especially working on rethinking settlements and, and actually we, we began to take, because in our mind, you speak about colonization and immediate, uh, simple mind of an architect would think immediately about the colonies or colonization colony. We began to work with the colonies and, and understand how to sort of begin to redefine them and sometimes even, you know, because the Israeli colonies are completely have an infrastructure that would not permit Palestinians from getting in. And, and the moment that you would think the houses are not the, prob the problem, the problem is with infrastructure on how you would erase this infrastructure, sometimes even changing a door, changing the, the, the doors instead of, so how we, you can reuse completely the architecture of occupation and the architecture of colonialism. And in that sense, there was a moment where you know a lot of things happened like a war in Gaza uh, other things and we say you know we don't want that our agenda is all the time dictating by what Israelis are doing we don't want to be dictated by the colonial agenda why don't we have our own everyday agenda that we would actually respect, move, and build on knowledge one over the other as a way not to be reactionary, but a way to, uh, you know, plan or play in, in that sense very much when they say, is it a game of ping pong or a chess? It's differently. I mean, sometimes when you live under colonialism, you have this idea that all what you are producing, you are producing in reaction. So Israelis are closing the door, uh, are closing a checkpoint, you are react to this, Israelis are. So in that sense, instead of only being reactionary, I find in this sort of playing chess, or if you want in, to put in your words, the everyday sort of practice might be a way of building our own uh, sort of um, agenda and, and, and way of resisting rather than to just, and I'm not here undermining the importance of reaction, of reacting because there are an amazing artworks that comes out of reacting to certain things. I'm, I'm not now, I'm, I'm only trying to say that each one of us would develop his own practice and definitely when we developed our practice, we had this um, very strong desire of having our own uh, get, I mean, to play chess rather than to play uh, ping pong. So we're re reusing uh, or readapting or or uh, breaking in or uh, would be the for one of architectural responses to to existing uh, existing architectural reinforcements of uh, of uh, of uh, conditions of life, for example. Yes, and uh, Carolina, uh, can you can you uh, um, your research practice, how do you start? Like when you, when you, when you, uh, when you enter the territory that, 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 uh, how did you start to look at this reality when, where, where you were invited to implement your own practice as a visual artist or, uh, and a researcher also? Mm, so it was my first time in the Middle East and the first time in Palestine and, um, and I didn't want to come there with the clear idea for the project, and I thought that it's just um, inappropriate attitude. And I really wanted to to make a research there with the people and through the discussions. And um, and I and I did two things basically in Palestine. So, but um, I'm okay. So when when you go to the Palestine for the first time, you just realize, um, you just see a lot of violence. And I mean, not only like um, in the West Bank, but like I'm, I'm, I'm talking about like whole Palestine, so occupied in 48. And, um, and, uh, and I was, um, and, and um, this is like a multi-layered violence and there were different practices. And I was 
I, I just decided not to concentrate on this very visible violence, but those different practices which are very vicious, but not that visible. So I concentrate on plants because I'm, um, this is also like, I, I work a lot with plants. And, uh, but, um, so I started the research of um, the plants which can tell about the colonialism and the Israeli occupation. And I, and I started to um, investigate also like the historic um, attitude and then um, maybe you can show some, some photos. And um, I'm probably what I will be saying now, it's totally obvious for the Palestinians sitting here. Sorry for that, but uh, I, I know that it's not um, at all obvious for the Polish, uh, Polish audience. So, um, can we stop for in this first one? So this is the JNF forest, and uh, so um, this is from like what the Zionists started from. Uh, they um, they um, were collecting. They they really wanted to change the landscape uh, completely, and they put a lot of effort to change the landscape to look less Arab and more. Um, um, Okay, so yeah, uh, so they started um, planting the pine trees, uh, which they know from from Eastern Europe, and just to uh, change the landscape that way that it will encourage more Jews to move to to Palestine. It was uh, they started this in the 30s, and they then they continued in the 40s, and uh, after Nagba, they also planted these pine trees. Uh, in the places where the Palestinian villages were um, located and when they just demolished the, the houses, but they planned uh, just using the pine trees as a camouflage. And they were collecting, can, we can go to the another. So we, they, they were, so um, they were sending to the Jews all around the world the, um, these blue boxes, the famous blue boxes, and they were collecting money. Uh, but the idea behind it and the, how they promoted it was the, uh, they used the slogan that they are going to make the desert green. So it is also like this kind of image that they just entered the deserted land. There's like no history there, no people there, and they are just going to make it bloom. And, um, and um, so the, um, the pine trees was one, the, one of the cases, but then uh, also they were using... Um, maybe I will... Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so they were using also the eucalyptus, and this is the case uh, uh, Sally told me about, that, um, for example, in Arab Shibli, when they really wanted to... Um, um, resettled or forced to um, move the, uh, the Bedouin community, they, they planted uh, eucalyptus trees just to, that the eucalyptus absorb a lot of water so the um, streams uh, just dry down and they, they were forced to move. And um, of, of course there's like the images that we can easily find in the internet like um, settlers burning olive trees and um, crops but I was like m mostly looking for this kind of practices that they are um, um, they're um, really accepted in the um, Western countries so uh, they how, how they use the ecological tools to really show it that they, they, they are right and they are doing right, that uh, right thing, that they are establishing new um, natural reserves in the places where the, also, of course, Palestinian villages were located. And they are also, um, um, they are also protecting nature and protecting endangered species, which are not endangered at all because they are like um, very popular um, species like uh, thyme and um, and sage and um, yeah the, um, and this is akub uh, yeah so they are <laughs> we don't know this plant actually but uh, it's yeah this is uh, the plant which grows in in the wilderness and um, and for Palestinian people as far as I know that it's um, it's a taste of the um, 
food, which like always like grandmothers and mothers prepared at home. So it's the yeah. So I was like trying to investigate all this kind of um, vicious practices of violence, which are um, you know basically a greenwashing practices. So. So, uh, um, so uh, um, your interest in plants had led you to this, uh, to naming the, the conflicting, uh, let's say, uses of, of, of them within both the Israeli and the Palestinian context. Yes. What, what, what's, what's, how, how, how did it work? Um, is it also like criminalizing uh, Palestinian um, Palestinians and also? Um, um, their tradition, because um, because uh, there is a ban that uh, Palestinian people can pick zatar, uh, uh, so thyme and sage and akub in the wilderness, and uh, and they can not only pay a fine but also go to prison because of of having a little amount of zatar, and um, and especially. Um, elderly people and especially women. Uh, are picking zatar uh, and and um, all, all these yeah, plants because because it's also like the way they can uh, earn some money. Many of them um, are are wives of of people who are in um, in, in Israeli jails. And uh, I would uh, if probably for. Deem that category of the, the, the would it be the landscape that uh, leads you when you settle, when you try to settle and try to understand the, the um, place or, or what is to be done there? Is the, this category well, relevant in, for you? When, when I applied for um, the, the open call, it was somewhere the, what I wrote about of, of traveling to Palestine and looking at the landscape, how power is manifest in the landscape but I think when when I when I arrived of course when, because I'm traveling alone I'm traveling with a camera and I was like a bit afraid because I, I don't know I cannot judge the situation so I felt a bit afraid of just like going into the wild and traveling with a camera and trying to capture everything so I think this is why at a certain point I um, well I was I was speaking with Khaldun and he gave me a book um, about uh, uh, hiking roads. But at the end of this book, he is also speaking about uh, Jalazon refugee camp, which is just outside of Ramallah. And this somehow caught my attention, and then I um, I asked Sally about it, and she said she could bring me in touch with people from Jalazon. Um, so one of the persons who worked in the municipality took me uh, the first time to the to the refugee camp. Um, and there I got introduced to um, uh, Musa Ambar, who is working for the Old Age Association. And I spent a lot of time with him in the office of the Old Age Association. It's a project <coughs> where they have like a kitchen, they cook for the old people and they bring the food around in a camp for the old people. Um, and I think this, is, this was his way of introducing me in the camp because he said like you cannot just walk in here and f freely go around because we have to look for your safety. And, but it, he's the one who started to introduce me to a lot of people. And then at one point I met with Anas, who is the son from Ayub, who also works in the organization. And he's like, a, he's like 25 years old um, and his English is very well. So I started to connect with him and his friends and we just spent a lot of time in, um, <clears throat> in the bar without me taking the camera because I, w I wanted just to get to know the people a bit. and to create a, a situation which is f as well for me as for them uh, somehow comfortable. Um, but then at, at one point it was Ayub, um, Anas's father, who 
um, showed me his phone and he, he, he insisted on me looking at the picture. And I see him on the picture and somebody else, which is his oldest son. And then later on, I I've, um, somebody told me it's a picture that he was taken in, in jail um, because his son is wearing a, a jail outfit. <clears throat> and that's, that's how I, 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 at one point, I, I, I got really curious to get to know the story behind his gesture of showing the picture. And that's when I asked Anas if he, if, if he could ask his father to speak about why he showed me the picture and what, what is... What I see on the picture, <coughs> it's Ahmed, it's, it's the picture here, the father and the son, and this is Ayub. But then of course, when it's like a, I had this first, somebody telling me a story, and then I started wondering like what this film could be. And I was a bit afraid of me misunderstanding a lot of what I see in the camp, so I, that's where the idea grew. That I, that I would have to figure out how to let people really speak about their situation instead of me trying to impose some artistic vision on what I see. And because, of course, if you go through the cam, there is a lot of communication on the walls, written drawings, portraits of martyrs. So, I, of course, I could have started filming this whole camp, but without really knowing what is the meaning of everything that is communicated onto the walls. And that's been a bit the starting point of trying to connect with a lot of people. And although I don't speak Arabic, so it's very difficult. Um, and it's a bit what you said also, like the, the last minute organization. Because at some point I, I got connected with Mohammed, who was going to work like a fixer. And, and then we sat together at the table and, and I tried to make a plan. And he would just go like, well, we don't do that making plans like that. <laughs> and that's... So it, it, it's a lot of things were just last minute on the phone. Shall we go? Can you come? And yeah, that's how it started off. Um, and I think the fact that I was there for three months, at the end I really realized if it would have been like a residency for a month, would, it would not even work for me to, to get these things organized. Because it's... Yeah, because it takes a lot of effort to, um, and a lot of appointments would be cancelled also last minute, or I would arrive in the camp and call somebody I had an appointment with, and he would not pick up, and that would be me go back, and because I, it's it's not like I felt uncomfortable in the camp, but to just go go around alone with a the camera, there are like easily four thousand kids running around which uh, I would attract their attention and they would just start gathering around me and... <laughs> uh, when Sally was uh, having her lecture, like, uh, there was this uh, um, question that you asked at certain moments uh, about the extremity of the of the of the climate of the of the weather as compared to extremity of the condition of life within the camp, and uh, just opening quite easy, uh, quite widely, I, I I just wanted to 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 kind of refer to this because there is a certain certain uh, affinity between this uh, uh, search for extremity, trying to name it, but also to trying to uh, being a f mm, uh, coming back to 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 the points where we can still find some safety to discuss it yeah? some safety to be able to even make a conversation like in uh, al madafa or like in artistic institution so you uh, you uh, and uh, i'm interested uh, this is an interesting feature of the art practice itself it seems that uh, somehow being attracted to this uh, extremity and trying to face it to deal it to name it uh, we are still trying to build a safe space and uh, and uh, and uh, and um, uh, and I would like to ask you whether this is maybe a way in which we can uh, refer to the need for artistic practice at all in such conditions, right? Not to um, go, uh, not to uh, 
uh, exaggerate, but to create the safe the, the safe space to be able to um, understand the the, um, the extremities that surround us. I, I don't know. I think that at least for me, it, it works very strongly as a, you know, I, I, so I came to the art uh, from an architectural point of view. So I, I guess that I come from a, a bit of a different angle where, you know, as, as, as an architect and working in Palestinian refugee camps, something that you would find a lot here, I mean, to design a tiny 500 meter square plaza, it took us seven years of discussing with people and changing and shifting and this and that. And, and it has been like incredibly uh, uh, contested and discussed and half camp with, half camp against and who use it, women are permitted, not permitted, etc., etc. And And there a lot of time when you work in architecture and on the ground and you want to shift things and change things, there is a lot of messiness, a lot of messiness. I mean, and you have to deal with this messiness. And in a sense, art was for us an amazing refuge. You know, I mean, a lot of time when I say architects sometimes in, in ideologies like under fascism or with the church or where there is a strong pop with give them the possibility to do whatever they want, they would just come out with what they, what they design in their mind they would see on the ground. And in that sense, I have to say that if I have to draw a parallel to this, if we're working with the messiness in refugee camps, the art institutions and the art space and the art exhibition was for us this tiny commission from the pop. Right? I mean, it was a moment where we had the possibility to think what we have in our mind and to put it there, right? And in, in that sense, maybe I don't know if I would put Al-Madafa among this, because for the other cases it's true, but Al-Madafa was a more, I think, a very strong uh, personal crisis that I had to deal with. You know, I am moving by definition somewhere else and I don't know how to live, literally. I mean, it begins like this. I don't know how to live and I do not want at this age to give up with my political agency. So it felt like almost a survival act rather than any other things. And, and by surviving and, and, and by not being, I mean, I am not by, um, nature a self-destructive person so i mean i tend to be optimistic and i tend to think how can i still be taking a very extreme condition and turn it around itself and and see the potentiality of it rather than the self-destruction and maybe this comes very strongly also as a result of and reaction to colonialism because if you know what I mean, it, it's not easy to live under colonialism and still be optimistic yet i think that it became I mean, it's in, in Sweden, it became much easier because it's not that I deal with the harshness of colonialism, but definitely I was in front of condition where on stake was my political agency, right? And in, in that sense, the creation of this project that exists between art and, and real life was much more departuring from a, a very strong question that I made to myself and then shared with the rest of, uh, of, of the world. And in that sense, you know, to come to your question about extreme weather or extreme political condition, I mean, in both of them, we are put in front of the fact to understand how tiny humans we are and how our life might go in a second and, and how you become unpredictable. I mean, your life become unpredictable. and. Uh, you know, something that, for example, I don't witness in a place like Stockholm. I mean, in Stockholm, people feel that things should go right. I mean, while in other, in, in places like in Alaska, in Anchorage, or even in Boden, north of Sweden, or in, in these places where weather is such nearby them and they see things changes constantly, they understood that life is unpredictable, right? And and. In that sense, this is where I see this, how, the, how we can understand 
this precarity, but, but trying to understand its potentiality and trying to become humble enough to understand how we will even understand our life as a temporary life and act as such rather than willing all the time to sort of uh, push everyone else among uh, uh, us into permanency. We are not permanent. Yes, thanks. Thank you. And uh, that uh, this uh, mm, story that uh, Vim has uh, referred to, the way how uh, how the experience had took him into the very dense network of relations within the city itself, like uh, was uh, was for me. Um, mm, interesting in the context of uh, of your also previous works where this uh, this, uh, this this attempt to deal with this extreme forms of uh, landscape and experience somehow was decided by you as a as a topic itself while here like as a, as an image that we had we the viewers have to confront ourselves with while here somehow like we came back to a very dense network of uh, human relationships instead of a portrait of an extreme situation. And uh, would you like to, to comment on the difference between what, what happened with uh, this kind of uh, your interest in this extreme like situations, like you portrayed the outpost in uh, Arctic Circle, still keeping the mining community uh, despite the, the, the extreme uh, condition and the end of coal, in a sense, or the, the main supply road in Kuwait with, uh, with uh, where still the life exists on whether we understand it or not while here like you uh, you started to go into this personal level much more it seems well that's that's a very big difference between what you say outpost filmed in um, in Svalbard um, and here I I really felt this necessity to really speak with people you know to, to not like in like when when I was in uh, in the Arctic when I look at people in the landscape, they're like almost part of this industrial process taking place. And, and, but, but here, it's, I have always felt the need to have a better understanding of the dynamics within the refugee camp. <clears throat> and it's only by, by talking with people, and in the beginning not even filming people, but by talking with them and, and by little bits of information that, I, that, that the puzzle becomes like more visible to me. That I, that's where I felt the need to, to speak with, with the people. Like for example, I, I saw all the time the portraits of the martyrs and, and they are, for many people, they, they speak to me about these are our heroes. But it was very difficult for me to look at it in this way. So I wanted to get like a like like a story behind these portraits, and that's when at one point I went to speak with Khaldun because I didn't know how to approach this. Or uh, and I went to speak with Khaldun, and we went together to two families, and the conversation usually started just with asking the parents like what what the boy's favorite food was and what his plans were in life and what he was doing with his friends and. And not Im not immediately going to the, the to the dramatic day, but to uh, to get an image of the person behind the portrait you see on the uh, on the the wall in the camp everywhere. Also here you see there is a well it, it will pop up later on. There is a portrait of um, it's a printed uh, poster of uh, Jasim who was um, who died in 2017, and you see the poster is really like. Um, it's like a very new poster, and he died in April 2017, so I guess because I, st I arrived 2nd of April in Palestine, so I guess this poster is each year as a kind of commemoration. His friends just hang the poster up again everywhere in the camp, because some of the posters look like really old, and this one looks like it's been hung up there uh, somehow yesterday. Or and there are also some of the images show um, it's the, the entrance of the house. This is the picture I speak about. Um, 
it's the, the entrance of the house to where, where Jasim used to live, and there you see all things sprayed on the wall by his friends. Um, and I saw the same with uh, Laid, who is the other. Um, this is Yasim towards his house. These are his parents. Um, and it was also the same when we went to Laid, lived a bit outside um, Jala zone in uh, Jifna. And also there, on the, just in front of the house, there is like a huge gravity, like a kind of tribute from his friends to, um, to Laid. And then sometimes, like, there were moments that, that, that Ehab is another guy I got to know, um, who would, out of the blue, suddenly drag me into a bus and take me to Ramallah. And it's something he arranged by phone I didn't know about, and then I would end up in the house of somebody who definitely wanted to speak with me. But it's, I'm still in the process of, of, of like, um, starting really to work on the film because there I still have none of the translations are done yet so for me there is still an awful lot to discover in all this conversation because people easily talk for an hour sometimes more sometimes less also but so there is still a lot to discover for me of um, of, of, of the things that I've been actually doing I mean, I always know the, the general topic people speak about, but not, not the detail um, of the conversation. And uh, if I'm, I would like to turn to Carolina again and uh, ask about this uh, work of, of research of work that you, you started to one, on one hand with the plants being a kind of a visible mode of communication between context. I also understand it this way, that this is something that allows that uh, you both understand and not. And this can be a powerful medium probably for, uh, for, for a conversation on the reality, but also of uh, some practical action. Uh, of, uh, uh, mm, but uh, like uh, mm, mm, the weeds and the, the project that you did in in Bieszczady and the one the, another uh, plant uh, plant project that you started in Palestine has this very strong um, opposition between something that looks very. Uh, mundane and something that that uh, that deals with uh, trauma and uh, and uh, displacement uh, on a uh, on a on a uh, of uh, whole populations. So uh, also this mediation between the extreme and the, and the mundane uh, seems uh, to be the way to understand and to work uh, with the, within the camp for you. Or uh, that, uh, w mm, but mm, is that uh, is uh, is uh, looking for the signs of the the bigger narrations uh, mm, something that uh, you could tell us more about, like how what what what, what happens with time, what happens with uh, uh, with uh, other plants, and uh, if you just could tell us the story, because this is something that we that we that we don't know. Um, so I look. Um, I wanted to like look closer um, to this kind of. Um, you know, to plants and soil and nature, and and treat it as a kind of an archive, and uh, and treat it as a kind of a living archive, and these plants as uh, material witnesses. Also, um, this this approach with, which uh, came from the forensics that uh, every uh, gesture leaves a trace is it's also like very important for me, and I was like looking for this kind of traces left in the landscape, like the traces of violence. And, and um, yeah, so um, you're asking about uh, time and like why, um, so um, it was, it was um, by Ariel Sharon put on the list of protected plants 
and um, and Palestinians can um, can collect it, can pick it in the in the wilderness, and uh, and it's. Um, and, and zaatar is like commonly used, like it's it's the most popular, um, you know, spice like plant and spices. Yeah, you wow. use in a in a um, uh, Palestinian cuisine, and um, and it's it's really important for for the identity, right? Like to and uh, and and there was no research behind it that they are. Um, decreasing and uh, it's just it's just you know imposing that by by law that Palestinians can't can't there is a ban that they can't uh, pick and yeah and cultivate their own traditions and uh, I um, probably instead of trying to create more common grants that uh, that uh, in here i maybe i just ask you to ask the questions to our our guests because it is quite difficult for me to mediate between so different practices and such different experiences but each of them kind of shows the the the, the pra open practice the practice that responds to the uh, response to the condition of life, like uh, Sandy uh, gives us the, the, the witness of her own life and uh, with uh, 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 Carolina and Vim uh, are trying to learn certain context, but uh, please, uh, if you have the questions that we can ask to our guests, I, I uh, leave the mic to the audience. Thank you very much. I was fascinated by the picture presented by Sandy of the Madafa in, uh, in the Siberian part of Sweden, uh, if I may use the term. And it's quite astonishing that you can create uh, such a formalistically hospitable atmosphere uh, in such a dismal, or at least visibly dismal, environment. I wasn't sure if this was supposed to be a, a prototype. Is it an incentive for people to emulate? And the question is, how do they, I'm talking about the Syrian family, how do they avoid, or maybe they don't want to avoid, exoticizing the phenomena, making it an exotic phenomena. And also, when I was watching this and listening to you very eloquently describing this process and your personal uh, uh, involvement in it, I was thinking how in many Catholic countries, I'm sure including Poland, but also in um, Western uh, Protestant countries, there is the notion of asylum. And how come this is not being invoked as the Anglo-Saxon or Western European or even Eastern European uh, equivalent of the Madafa? Because the asylum exists, and people are seeking asylum today, of course, in a very secular terms. But deep in the Catholic culture of Europe, there's the notion of the asylum. Why is this not being invoked as a way of dealing with the question of refugees, refugeehood? And has it, have you thought about it as a parallel to the Madafa? I mean, I, I would depart from your um, first question from, uh, you know, is, is there a risk of this becoming exotic? And, and in a sense, you know, just imagine it this way. Budin is one of these places, like many other small towns in south, in, in the north of uh, Sweden, where 
Sometimes people were telling me that, that they might spend three or mo four months to begin to know each other because things are, you know, it's not, it's not like you jump in a place like Palestine and you feel the need of knowing people, no? I mean, in there, it takes really a while and one of the major things that people were telling me constantly is that they are isolated, they are alone, they are with no one, they feel that, uh, and, and it, sometimes there is this, Again, what I described as feeling that you are not behaving, right? I mean, there is, and, and this refers also to your maybe second question, because I think that they, the, the notion of asylum was not referred to as much as the fear of these refugees arriving and alterating what this clean, polite, low public space is all about. And, and there is this worry of, from like the sides of, for example, Sweden, but this can be uh, in other countries, there is this worry of these people are coming to change, to change our habits and to change our public space and we would not permit them to do so. While from the side of refugees, there is this fear that we are not here to change anything. We are here to behave. We are here to be guests. We are here to... So in that sense, I think that I had much more to deal with the notion of no reference and no space for people to meet rather than uh, the, the whole... Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, instead of saying they are becoming exo exotic, I would say that what Yasmin and Brahim and the few of them fears, actually, is that maybe they are not behaving properly by doing this project. So it's not that they feel that they are becoming stars or important or this or that or even exotic or bringing the Syrian uh, uh, culture here and have the tradition. Rather than are we by demanding this, by claiming us being the host, by opening this place towards the, by challenging institutions, because matter of fact, you know, there are a lot of institutions in Budin that are there to serve refugees, and they feel this project is a bit unclear. I mean, what is it? Why refugees now suddenly are taking in hands what is not theirs? We should serve them, right? And, and Brahim and Yasmin, I feel that they are constantly, together with others, now they are, they are not alone, but together with us, they are constantly trying through this project to understand how they behave not the way they told that they should behave. Because at the end, you get out from track, but you are worried that maybe this is wrong and that you know, they are still receiving uh, uh, help from the government. They are, so people are not willing, I mean, even by doing such small projects, all they, what they want to, to do is not, I mean, I would not fear the being exotic rather than they are worried that they sort of are breaking rules. And in that sense, I was really fascinated by Yasmin insisting on this as an art project. And once I sit with her and I ask her, Yasmin, why do you, why are you claiming all the time that this is an art project? Because this is their life. I mean, they are, uh, and she says, because in art, you can break rules, not in life, right? So it's this idea that even if we are breaking rules, this is the project, this is her project, this is the artist project, we are not the first ones to breaking rules. So I mean, in that sense, I really don't see the risk of them being neither instrumentalized or exotics, rather than they have, they fear to be seen by institutions and by others, like the ones that they were not grateful for Sweden, for, uh, for all what they were given to. And in that sense, I think I'm answering your second question by saying, instead of asylum, it's they are these refugees, and, and, and unfortunately, a lot of po politicians use the fear of refuge today, now in Europe, in order for them to actually still be passing their agenda. So the refugees, instead of them becoming asylum seekers in the way it should be intended, they are becoming what, uh, they are becoming the card of fears for many politicians to still be actually doing whatever they want to do. And in that sense, by them claiming their sort of uh, right to host and they're by cl claiming their agency, they are also claiming a space to show that they are not that fear 
that everybody is referring to. So in that sense, I guess that there is a huge shift, in, especially in the last 20 years of crisis of refugees in Europe. And, and it was really shifted from them being accepted as Azenium seekers into being all the time seen as cards of fears that is constantly used. I mean, even with places where you have, you don't even have the phenomena of refugees. It's so small and numbers are ridiculous. They are constantly still be used as the cards of fears. Look, if you don't take us, this is what you are waiting for, refugees that would come and, and change, shift your life, take your work, take you this, take that. I mean, being uh, veiled in the public space, uh, being loud in the public space, shouting in the buses. This is what is all the time described, rather than people bringing, you know, such, uh, you know, hospitality is also a sort of a very interesting ethical and etiquette and way of behaving and way, and, and in the, I have to say that, you know, I, I see, for example, speaking about the Arab world, I see all the time Arabs uh, self, uh, destructive, unless, except it comes, when it comes to hospitality, we have again our pride, because we are among these people that actually still use hospitality on every day of life as a way and matter of organizing society, while in a place like Sweden, it's becoming a luxury. It's not anymore a real uh, pr social practice. It's more a sort of, you know, a luxurious of we don't need each other, we don't do it in order for us to organize the society, we do it as an extra, eventually once a year, if we are up to it and we have to prepare our house as a very special, mo so in that sense I feel that there was also a loss of the art of hospitality in Europe and that if I see, and I still would like to see, the arrival of refugees as a good potential. I think hospitality might be one of these domains of real exchange, rather than you know, to see this only as an instrumental to a project. I don't know if I answered you, but yeah. <laughs> Very deep and complicated, and thank you for the question. I am really inspired by the lecture. I have a very small question. Uh, uh, what is home sweet home uh, for Sandy Hilal? Not where, uh, I'm not using where. What is home sweet home for you? Oh my God. What is home sweet home? I, I mean, I'm not sure. I, I think that all these uh, projects and crises is, is because I, I thought that there is home, sweet home. I, I don't know, for example, for me still, my parents are still alive, so I don't know, my mother is still a sort of a very important uh, source of uh, knowledge and, and uh, so and that's, and, and, and you know, I, I work with my partner and, and we have a lot of, um, sort of uh, men mental and intellectual growth together. So sometimes when I feel home, sweet home is also this amazing moment of breaking home, sweet home. So it's not only, sometimes it's not only building this home, sweet home, it's sometimes have the courage to destroy what you think home, sweet home is all about. So I think that it's it can be, and I don't know, I mean, home sweet home, I am a mother of two daughters. So I mean, when, when I am with my husband and the two daughters under the same roof, I finally feel safe and home sweet home. But I don't know if I'm answering you, I don't have an intellectual answer for, when you speak about sweet, it comes to me more uh, as emotions and where I feel, I mean, it's maybe my, my family, it's breaking certain rules and regulations when I feel safe to break them. I mean, this is like, you still belong to home the moment that you decide you don't belong to the same thing that was given to you when you were born, but you can make it yours and, and eventually hope that your kids will make it theirs and not only to imitate what was their grandparents. And, and in that sense, I don't, I still, believe and firmly think that one of my main teachers was first my grandmother and then my mother, yet 
I don't want to live within their dress. I mean, I, I do want to have my own dress and I am hoping for my daughters to have their own dress. And for me, the home sweet home is not to reserve only my grandmother sweet home, but to still be having other sweet homes that I can contribute myself into building. And, and this is maybe my, sometimes if you would ask me what is my frustration in a place like Palestine is that I realized how sweet is my grandmother home, but I still would like to build my own. So in, in that sense, and it feels, because we lost also our grandparents' home, we feel that we should only protect this, but sometimes I feel that this might be our own cage. So I, I mean, I would like to avoid the cage of only living in my grand home house without really destroying it rather than to build my own uh, sweet home and be able to have others building it and give generations their, uh, their, their, their um, chance to build their sweet uh, homes. And thank you for the question, it was a, a very nice one. Uh, my name is Juha, I'm from Finland, and this is more like a comment, uh, um, a little bit to follow, follow up what just Sandy just said. So, uh, and maybe as a side note, I, I grew up in a small village, not so different from Puden, it has just one st street. <laughs> and, and, and to me, um, like, uh, like the, the pictures that you showed, they are very familiar. And I know the winter as well. And to me, that's normal. It's not extreme. It's it's normal. And also the the way the the kind of the emptiness of the public space that's also normal. The the relationships they are built in a in a in a different different way. But um, but in terms of this temporariness, um, there is this sort of this this sort of um, uh, at least in Finnish context. And that's, uh, it's, it's really kind of now deeply embedded somehow in the society, this notion that, that everything is temporary. <laughs> and the, and one, one outcome that has been in the news a lot now is, is the, the, uh, the, uh, that, that there's the lack of babies. I mean, it's been an issue for a long time that there's not enough babies born in Finland. So, like the, so Finland is, shrinking but now it has become even more extreme so so we are facing a situation that there's soon more puppies born than babies <laughs> so we are becoming a country of more dogs than people um and and it's really something that that it's yeah yeah it's been in the news a lot now because of a lot of studies uh about why this is and there's no one explanation but this it's not the lack of, of not being able to plan, because people are, can actually plan, but they want to kind of plan wisely, and, and somehow I, I think a lot of them just make this assessment that they cannot sort of create such a, I mean, sort of safe, uh, sort of sweet home, sweet home, that, that okay, that they would be ready, ready to have a, have a family. So, so then it kind of becomes, uh, that soon uh, it is this this Finnish people who are around there. It's this temporary kind of tribe that will be kind of I mean disappearing and shrinking and and uh, uh, but there's but there's a lot of these other dynamics there. Like one dynamic is that these small villages are are becoming abandoned because people who are still left they move to the cities. But then there's this counter movement that these become these like tabula rasas that there is this empty village, and then people are moving in and then sort of like starting from scratch and kind of reinventing their own communities because they kind of have to. So yeah, but it's a uh, yeah, that's somehow the dynamic up north. <laughs> So we are ending up with this. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Thank you, Sandy, Carolina, and Vim. And I would <laughs> like with a moment of babies waiting at home. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, this is not the last uh, moment of today's evening, so I would like to invite you for people with no poetry. It's a defeated people. Uh, this is a J party by Timo Tuchkanen, and uh, it starts uh, half past nine. So now break to change and then party. <laughs> Thank you a lot for your presence.